All right, when we continue, former mobster Kevin Weeks with his new book. Kevin Weeks was Whitey Bulger's right-hand man for most of the 25 years that Whitey Bulger ruled South Boston's underground. He spent about five years in prison on racketeering and money laundering charges and as part of a plea deal helped the feds with the prosecution of former FBI agent John Connolly. Now Kevin Weeks has a new book, Brutal, the untold story of my life inside Whitey Bulger's Irish mob. And Kevin Weeks is here. Welcome. Thank you. You've been making the media rounds the last couple of weeks, starting with 60 Minutes was not a bad start. Um, Dennis and Callahan this morning here, you've been around a lot of local and, and regional media. People are, are being critical at this point. They're saying, uh, I know Dennis and Callahan got a lot of criticism this morning, I'll probably get some uh, for interviewing you here today. How do you respond to that when people say, why are you giving a mobster, a confessed mobster, this kind of publicity? What would you say if you were me? Well, I wouldn't blame you. I mean, <laughs> uh, it's not something that uh, I wanted to do, uh, look forward to doing. I'll be glad when it's over. But, Meaning uh, the interview? Every, no. <laughs> this whole book tour type thing, uh, this was all done to, uh, for the victims' families to receive money from the proceeds of the book. And yeah. how much are they getting out of the proceeds? Uh, they get 50% of my end, what I have received. And, and you, but you only get like 15 percent or something? No, like that? I, uh, I think it's a little over 42 percent, and they get 50 percent of that. And is the book doing well so far? From what I understand, it is. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you refer to in the book over and over again is that is the media. You say the, the media, it's the old cliche, never look at the facts, get in the way of a good story. But I read this book, and I've heard the other sides. Why should? we, the media, or anybody out there, believe your version over the one that has been told in various media outlets? Well, first of all, it's firsthand. I was there. Uh, media takes it from uh, various sources. You know, there's a lot of allegations and stuff, but I was there. I lived it. And uh, my story has been corroborated by the DEA and the state police and the Justice Department who was investigated. And uh, there's also been other people that have been involved in this case. Uh, criminals as myself that have cooperated what I have said. Well, one of the stories that is wildly divergent, of course, is this one about Stippo's liquor store. Correct. We spoke to Julie Riggs, now Dahmer, in 2001, who certainly has a completely different version sure. of events than what you say in this book and what's been, she says, first of all, she says you, uh, Frank Salemi, and Whitey Bolger were at her house. She wasn't there, she was at the liquor store. You say Whitey Bolger wasn't there. You differ about whether the gun barrel was put no, in the child's mouth. You say that didn't happen. I mean, she claims, let me just finish it for you, people who don't know the story, that it was a total shakedown, that you and your associates shook down her and her husband, gave them $67,000 to overtake the, the, the liquor store, but she never wanted to sell it. Well, you know, that's uh, Julie's story, and that's Julie's story based on what her husband told her. First of all, Frank Salemi wasn't involved in it at all. It was James Bulger, myself, and Stevie Fleming came into it later on. Uh, Stippo approached us through his sister, reached out to us to buy the store from him. We did not go to him, we did not grab him, we did not ask him for the store, he approached us. What did you want to buy the store? Well, you know, the truth of the matter is, uh, Jim wanted a legitimate Jim business. Jim being Right, he wanted a legitimate business. Did he or did he want a, a, some, a front for an illegal business? No, he actually thought it was better to get into a legitimate business. You know, um, I knew Stippo well, and uh, I wasn't too keen on the idea of getting involved in it with him at all. But Stippo had sold his wife a bill of goods, exactly how the shakedown went down. And uh, it didn't occur anything like he said. I, I don't uh, argue the fact that in the end, that uh, we did, uh, you know, there was a gun on the table. Uh, his daughter, you know, reached out for the gun and pushed away from her, but there was no gun put into his daughter's mouth. There was no, uh, you know, we did not approach him. He approached us through his sister. Mm -hmm. And both his sisters have testified and they've stated in the paper that uh, he was lying mm -hmm. about it. So I don't blame Julie Do uh, Damas for what she's saying. Mm -hmm. she, she said it originally she was looking to get the store back. I'm not sure where that stands. Mm -hmm. Going back, to your initial involvement with Whitey Bulger. I mean, people knew each other well in the South Boston area, but when he kind of adopted you, did you realize from the start that 
that was it, that was going to be a life of crime for you? And because you knew who, who he was. He was yeah, older um, than you. I came into a circle when I was 18 years old. I was working as a bouncer. And it wasn't like this happened overnight. It was a progression over the years that I became deeper and deeper uh, involved in crime. And then uh, when I was involved with the murder, double homicide with Brian Howe and Michael Donio, I knew then my life was over and my life had changed for good. But, but you continued. At that point, you really had no choice. I, I mean, I had been involved in serious crime with them. I had been involved in murder with them. And then basically, there was no walking away at that point. You told uh, Ed Bradley on 60 Minutes, and you say in your book that you were um, you know, an, an accomplice to murder. But did you ever murder? Were you no. right there? Did you pull triggers? Did you stab? Did you help uh, pull I, teeth I, out? Did no, you? no, no. I've been involved in fights where people got hurt, and you know, a fellow tried to stab me one time, and I did shoot him. But as far as the murder is concerned, no. Well, why should anybody believe that, uh, that you didn't actually commit the murders? Well, it's been proven. I mean, Steve Fleming pled out to the ten murders, and he, he cooperated who mm -hmm. actually did the killing and stuff. But you knew exactly where the bodies were buried? Correct. Why did you know that? I helped to bury them. So you were there for the actual burials. Did you, did you witness the murders? Yes. Mm -hmm. How did you come to cooperate with the FBI, or the federal government, I should say, regarding um, John Connolly? Did they approach you? Did you say, I know more, I can say what his involvement was with this? How did that happen? Um, when I reached an agreement with the uh, DEA and the state police on the investigation, the Justice Department came into it. And uh, one fellow that had already been uh, indicted had already talked about John Conley, and they came to me. And part of my plea agreement was to be truthful and honest about it, everything that I had done. And so uh, John Conley's name came up, and I told him what I knew about John Conley. Is John Connolly guilty of everything that he's been charged with? Um, well, it remains to be seen. He's charged with uh, murder. murder now. Right. Is he so, guilty of murder, in your opinion? Well, I don't think, uh, you know, that, that remains to be seen by the courts. You know. What but do you think? Did John Connolly tip off about uh, this gentleman? Yes. Uh, according to Jim Bolton. The Matarana? No, about uh, Callahan, Callahan, the fellow that was murdered down in the uh, Mm -hmm. uh, Florida. Uh, was he guilty of the charges of uh, tipping off the indictments? I mean, yes. Do you think he was definitely guilty of tipping off Whitey Bolger before the indictment was going to come down in well, 1995? Well, definitely. He told me. Yeah. And I told Jim Bolger. Oh, so you were the one who actually relayed the message? Correct. Mm -hmm. You know, you write in your book how you had such a normal upbringing. You know, there was always food on the table. Your father and your mother had arthritis, but your, you know, your father was a hard worker. You have five successful younger brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, not younger. Um, some of them went to Harvard. How did you get into this track when the others went on another? Um, well, my, my uh, mother had arthritis, severe arthritis. My father had a heart attack, and uh, I started working instead of going to school. My brother got me. Uh, into Commonwealth Prep the following year, and uh, f based on that, I would go to Harvard. You know, they like legacies, and, st and uh, but it wasn't for me. I was just out of school too long. I really wasn't interested, in, and uh, so I started working bouncing, and uh, that's how I came in the circle of these people. And uh, you know, I got involved. Was there good money in bouncing? Uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty good money, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was working three jobs at the time too, mm -hmm. so I mean, it, it was pretty good money. Mm -hmm. Going back to the media again, you've got a, you've got a lot of you know kind of built up frustration, anger, contempt for certain members of the media. Howie Carr, probably chief among them. A lot of people feel the same way you do about Howie Carr, but would not have thought about taking it to the next step. Why did it bother you? What Howie Carr wrote or said about you? Well, it was I think it was a. Uh accumulation of articles over the years and uh, not just about ourselves but other people that he attacked you know Howie Cow was not uh, a central figure to the book yeah he was just this whole one, chapter well you know it's actually about <laughs> three or four paragraphs I think but yeah. uh, Howie Cow was uh, believe it or not Jim Bulger decided to make him a hobby and uh, you know we looked uh, at Howie Cow and uh, to kill Howie Cow. Howie doesn't believe that well I mean Howie don't believe a lot of things you know if you read what Howie writes I don't believe any of that either mm. Well, he went back and sort of tried to reenact how you could have been across the street, and uh, you probably read the column. Well, 60 Minutes uh, went out there. They went out the graveyard, 
And I told him we don't have anything out, and there's a big opening in the wall. It's about 20 feet wide, and it leads right into his driveway of his house. And I think so. But going back to what I asked you, what difference does it make what he says or writes about anybody? I, he I, writes about politicians. He writes about everybody. Yeah, he does. In the was, same vein. It was just, um, I think at the time, we were more or less bored. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's the truth, though. Yeah. And uh, there was downtime, and... Uh, Jim Bulger decided that, uh, you know, to kill Howie Cowell, and that's how it came apart. Have you read his book, The Brothers Bulger? You know, I read uh, the excerpts in the uh, Herald. I wanted, uh, read uh, uh, Monday's excerpt, and I found uh, four mistakes. I mean, it was just... So you think he doesn't have the facts straight there? I think he's very inaccurate at what he's reported. Mm -hmm. He attributes murders to Jim Bulger that he didn't do. Uh, he talks about... Uh, you know, reaching out for him down Louisiana, that never happened. You talk about flying out to Chicago, that never happened. I drove out to Chicago. I mean, he has a lot of inaccuracies. You said on the air in the book, you, you don't know where uh, Whitey Bulger is. That's, that's probably true. Do you think anybody has any idea? I think that uh, he cut ties with everybody back here. I think that's, uh, I mean, it's one of the things you always stressed when you go on the run, that you have to cut ties with everyone back here. That's what will lead to you. That's mm -hmm. the one big mistake people make. Mm -hmm. And do you think he's still living off of various stashes of funds that he said he put millions in various offshore bank accounts? I believe but so. That's, that's easy to trace these days. No, really. Numbered accounts, it really isn't. I mean, you can get a, a Swiss account and it's very hard. I don't believe they even have a treaty with the United States to give up those accounts. It's not mm -hmm. as easy as you think. Mm -hmm. Some of them can be broken, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So what's, uh, what's the next generation for you? I think that... Um, you know, just go back to work and try to live a normal life. And You're not worried up. about getting whacked yourself at this point? Well, I mean, you know, I'll probably get hit with a plane before I get whacked. <laughs> <laughs> Those days are over. Yeah. All right, Kevin Weeks, book is brutal. Thanks Thank you coming. very much. Thank you. And right, when we continue, our dot compass looks for Whitey online.